Hi, this is Robert Rapier and this is R Squared Energy TV. On this week's episode, I've got questions on natural gas and about the long recession hypothesis that I've put forward. So the first question, you mentioned the long recession. I was wondering if the further development of nuclear energy or hydraulic fracturing would offset the length of the recession. Are these the only alternatives available to us? So first of all, uh, just to reiterate what the long recession is, it says that uh, you know historically oil production uh, goes up sharply whenever prices go up somewhat and we get an excess of supply and prices fall back down. And so this is how the oil, the oil industry has been cyclical for, for uh, ever in that way. It's boom and bust, boom and bust. So there will come a time, and we may be at that point now, where the new capacity that's built can't outpace the new demand. And what happens in that case is that as the new capacity is built out, you don't get the kind of relief in prices that you've gotten before. And so high oil prices have put us in recession, uh, but generally demand falls a little bit, more production comes online, prices go down, we come out of recession. The long recession says that that won't happen because demand will continue to remain high and grow in developing countries, and we have seen that over the past few years, and so we haven't seen the kind of relief from oil prices that, that uh, we're used to seeing uh, when the economy slows down in the U.S. And so it has led to a protracted, uh, difficult economy in the U.S. My long recession, uh, we may not be technically in recession, but you know, for all practical purposes, the economy is very, very slow and, and sluggish. So um, hydraulic fracturing and nuclear energy, the long recession is really about liquid fuel, or, or let's say uh, transportation fuel, not so much about electricity. I think uh, electricity costs are still quite reasonable, and so nuclear power, uh, while it can potentially provide cheap electricity, it won't do much to offset uh, the long recession scenario. The other thing is it's going to take 10 years or so to build out nuclear plants. I don't think in that amount of time, I think, I think that over that period of time, over the next 10 years, the long recession will really kick in and, and um, um, you know, that, that nuclear is not going to be able to mitigate that. Now, hydraulic fracturing is a different story. We have very low natural gas prices right now, and that has been a relief uh, to consumers. Uh, they're paying very, those that are on natural gas are paying very low energy bills, and that's helped offset the impact of high oil prices somewhat. So to that extent, you can say it's already helping. Uh, it's provided a lot of jobs. I mean, th this is not a debate about the merits or, uh, of hydraulic fracturing. I just want to, I'm just commenting on you know, the financial implications and how that has impacted the economy. It's been beneficial to the economy to have low natural gas prices. Um, were it not for that and consumers were paying another one or two hundred dollars a month more than they are now for natural gas, uh, I think the economy would, would still be in uh, quite a bit worse shape uh, than it even is now. So second question is also about natural gas. Um, Robert, you mentioned in at least one of your TV episodes about compressed natural gas vehicles, at least for the average consumer, probably not being worth the extra costs associated with them due to EPA licensing fees or requirements. Why are these restrictions in place? Why doesn't the EPA lift these requirements to make CNG vehicles more affordable for everyone so we can cut down our use of crude oil? Would you be for or against that? Um, I actually contacted, um, you know, I originally wrote a story about CNG vehicles and I was contacted by Mark Rausch at the Auto Channel and he's the one that told me about these uh, very stringent licensing requirements. And, um, you know, I, I, I looked up a little bit of information and, and here is why you don't get them for used cars. Uh, it's, it's very, very seldom you have an EPA approved conversion system for used cars. Uh, the process of engineering, manufacturing, installing, pretesting, and then submitting a proposed retrofit system for certification is time consuming and expensive and it may cost as much as $200,000 or more per engine family. Now for somebody that's selling new cars, that expense may be worth it uh, if you've got a lot of, you know, you're going to sell a lot of this particular model. 
um, it's definitely a detriment to those who would like to convert uh, existing vehicles. Why are those licensing requirements so high? I don't know. I do know that I've been in foreign countries that had very cheap little auto taxis that ran on natural gas. Um, maybe the safety standards weren't exactly the same. Maybe, I, I, I just can't really say. But what I did, I contacted Mark Roush again, who knows more about this than I do, and I will read his response. There's been some relaxing of EPA rules on which vehicles can be converted and the fees involved, but not nearly enough to make a difference in the used vehicle market of converting existing vehicles. For new vehicles, Fiat Chrysler has introduced a Ram pickup that can use CNG or gasoline, and they're promising more. Sergio Marchione, head of Fiat Chrysler, is a fan of CNG. Fiat in Europe offers several models that can use CNG. GM has built a couple thousand CNG trucks under special order, and they're talking about doing more. Honda continues to make the Civic CNG, but production is still limited. He goes on to say there's still a great deal of stonewalling and denial over the potential of CNG. For example, uh, he links to a story, um, and I'll link to it in the essay about, uh, in, in, I'll link to it in the story about new uh, California Air Resources Board regulations. To make a long story short, they're scamming the public by pushing electric vehicles and ignoring everything else. Uh, the story's a bit long and may be worth reading. I think you'll easily get the point I make about ignoring non-electric solutions and how CARB is really doing nothing more than setting up a situation where they can increase state registration fees. It's a real political game. So to the extent the EPA can, can uh, do something to help promote natural gas vehicles, I think it would be very beneficial. Um, you know, the cost of natural gas is about one-tenth per BTU, the cost of oil. I know that a lot of big trucks are converting, and if you're a fleet owner of big trucks, it pays out quite fast if you, if you pay to have those vehicles converted. Um, but still, with the system in place, you won't see a lot of uh, post-sale conversion of these because of those very stringent licensing requirements. And uh, you know, according to Mark there, that's more of uh, the government trying to pick technology winners, possibly and trying to say electric cars are the solution and making it more difficult for some uh, solutions. So with that, that's this week's episode. Please tune in next week. Thank you.